Okay, I think we'll uh, make a start now. So I'm going to kick off by giving a brief overview of the course and uh, a bit of administrative information. Um, and then we'll crack on into the, into the first main lecture. Okay, um, so just briefly say that uh, all the material on this course is, is under Creative Commons license. Um, and so it basically means that you, you can copy and redistribute any of the material um, uh, as long as you give us credit, essentially. Okay, so this course is uh, being offered both under the Archer 2 service and also the uh, Praise Patsy training centers. Um, so for, for Archer 2, uh, these are the, the partners in, who are involved. Um, so it's basically a collaboration between the UK Research Council's EPCC at the University of Edinburgh and Cray who provide the hardware. So Archer 2 is the current UK National Supercomputing Service, um, which is managed by the Research Councils and is housed and operated uh, by EPCC in Edinburgh. And this training is provided by the uh, CSE support team. Um, so we do around 60 days a year at various locations, or at least it would be various locations in in normal times, uh, and that's available to uh, free to, to academics. So the full Archer system, when it comes on stream, will be uh, just short of 6,000 nodes with 128 cores per node. So it's just short of three quarters of a million cores. Um, so these nodes have 256 gigabytes of memory uh, with a few uh, large memory nodes with double that. It uh, has the Cray slingshot interconnect um, and uh, assorted file systems. However, the current system that we're working working on and which you have access to you today is a four cabinet system. So that's a thousand and twenty four nodes. Um, so that just has a single file system uh, and it doesn't have any of the large memory nodes to on it. Okay, so some of this I'll just skip over very quickly. Uh, EPCC is the UK's National Supercomputing Centre. Um, some of this is very, out, very, some of this is a bit out of date. We're a lot more than 65 staff at the moment. Okay, um, so resources for this course. Um, so this course and upcoming courses you'll find under the, uh, under the first link here on the Arch2 webpage. And there's also, we keep an archive of material from all the past courses. So the, the material from this course will all get moved into, into that uh, material repository uh, at some point fairly soon after the course is finished, but it will essentially remain there for the lifetime of the Archer service at least. Um, so you know, if you need to come back and access it, it will, it will always be there. Um, there's also, we also do virtual tutorial, uh, and then there's also, you may find useful at some point, uh, the, the full Archer 2 documentation, which contains everything about uh, you know, how to log on, how to compile, how to run batch jobs and, and all that kind of stuff. Okay, um, so I want to introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Mark Bull. I'm a Senior Research Fellow at EPCC. Uh, I'm also involved in, in teaching uh, our MS, MSc program in high performance computing. Uh, and I'm also EPCC's representative on the OpenMP ARB, which is the standards body which looks after OpenMP. And joining me on this course uh, will be Adrian Jackson, a research fellow in EPCC and, and is also involved in, in uh, teaching our master's programme. 
Okay. Um, towards the end of the course, and we'll also prompt you to ask us, uh, please, uh, I know it's a bit early to be talking about feedback, but uh, we will ask you to, to, uh, to, to fill a feedback form in. It's very helpful for us um, to improve, continuously improve our, our teaching and, and these courses. Um, if you have general queries about, about Archer, then, then the help desk email is, is there. So if you have a, you know, a particular support query, so uh, you know, if you have, for example, if you have uh, you know, problems logging in, problems um, with your uh, SSH keys and so on, then obviously we'll, we'll try uh, our best to help out in the first instance. But, uh, but we may ask you just to, to go through the help desk if we can't fix it for you in, in short order. Okay, so in terms of access to the system, um, you have been given the opportunity to apply for uh, project accounts for this course under the TA039 project. Um, that just has a small amount of budget in it. Um, the main purpose of that is it allows us to use a reservation uh, to access dedicated compute nodes and get our jobs to, to around quickly. Uh, if you already have a have your own Archer account, um, then it's absolutely fine to use that. Um, you just won't get access to the quick turnaround in the reservation. Um, you can use the um, all the uh, all the jobs that we'll be running in this course are single node jobs, so you can run in the you can run them in the short queue. Um, so you'll probably get reasonable turnaround in there as well. Um, so all these accounts will be closed uh, within two weeks of the end of the course. Uh, everything will get wiped. So uh, we and I will remind, I'll try to remind you again. But you know, if you want to keep copies of anything that you, any of the exercises, code that you've developed, and or results that you've got during this course, then uh, please take copies in short order after the course ends, because they will just disappear. Okay, uh, yeah, all the course materials, so the slides and all the exercise material will continue to be available on the Arch2 website. Um, just like to very briefly draw your attention to the code of contact. Um, so basically, we just expect everybody in the course to to uh, to be nice, <laughs> okay? Um, so use welcoming, inclusive language, be respectful, and uh, just you know be be nice to to everybody else. Okay, um, so I will skip over funding stuff. Quickly mention because this is uh, we're also offering this course, and I know uh, a lot of attendees are from outside the UK today, which is great to see. And um, so this is also being offered through the uh, Partnership for Advanced Training uh, for Advanced Computing in Europe (PRACE) project uh, uh, as via our training centre. So um, PRACE has members across um, many countries in the in the EU. Uh, and 10 uh, price training centers. Okay, so uh, here's the timetable for today. So these, this is also available on the, uh, on the front page of the, uh, of the course documentation, uh, course materials link. Um, so which I've, uh, which I've posted in the, in the chat window. Um, so you can you can navigate to your hopefully just navigate yourselves directly to the uh, to the GitHub repository with all the material on it. So we'll be doing a a mixture of uh, Adrian and myself talking, and then also giving you time to do some some practical sessions on on the machine, uh, and we'll be around online to to help out and and answer any questions. <clears throat> 
Um, so that's for today. Um, so we'll have uh, we'll have some breaks as well for we'll have a mid morning, mid afternoon break, uh, and and an hour for lunch. Uh, and then same tomorrow. Um, so again, a mixture of a mixture of lectures and practical sessions, uh, but we'll just finish a little bit earlier. Okay, there's the link to the material again. Again, it's uh, you can just go to the chat window on Collaborate and, and click the link to get there if you're not already there. Um, there is some template code for the practical exercises. Um, so uh, the easiest way to, so, okay, that's on the GitHub repository. But the easiest way to get hold of it is just to do just to copy it directly once you're on on Archer. The important thing to stress here is that you must first of all navigate to your work directory on Archer. Uh, when you log in, then you are in your home directory, but you cannot run batch jobs from your home directory. So uh, it's easiest if you just simply uh, navigate direct, navigate to your home, navigate from your home directory to your work directory, uh, and then do everything in your work directory. Okay, so do uh, copy the code there, do all the code building and stuff, and submit batch jobs, everything from your from your work directory. Okay, um, hope you're going to enjoy this course, but, uh, and I know it's being online is, uh, is a little awkward and difficult, but we very much encourage you to use, to, to ask questions. And uh, in the first instance, at least, please use the chat window to, to type questions in. Um, we'll be monitoring that to our best of our ability uh, and while, we're, while we're talking, so, uh, but, uh, please, please feel free to chip in with questions at any point. Don't have to wait to the to the end end of the end of the talks. Okay. So on that note, does anybody have any questions before we begin? Okay, so a couple of questions coming up. Okay, uh, is there any N file that points to the work? Um, no, it isn't. You just simply have to uh, take the path to your home directory and replace slash home with slash work. Okay, and can you submit your job from your own Arch account to the TA39 position partition? No, unfortunately that you can't. You have the uh, the reservation is only accessible from accounts in TA zero three nine. So if you're using if you're using your own Archer account, then I, I uh, you can certainly try using the short queue um, for for this because the, the uh, all the all the jobs that we're running will certainly fit in the in the short queue. But can't guarantee what the load on that's going to be like. It's it's generally okay. Great. So on with the first lecture then. So uh, to begin with, we're going to give a uh, a fairly classical view of computer architecture, and um, so that we're all up to speed with the some of these concepts and terminology, uh, and then I'll. Uh, towards the end of this talk, I'll focus a little bit more uh, on the specifics of the Arch2 nodes with the with the AMD Rome processors. Okay, so just a very very 
top level simple approach to start with. Um, so essentially, you know, we can think of those four principal technologies that uh, that are put together to make up HPC systems: uh, processors to do the calculation, memory for temporary storage of data, the interconnect to allow processors to talk to each other, uh, and storage. So uh, for the purposes of this course, we're really focusing on the first two of those. So the processors and memory that constitute a single mode. And we'll essentially won't be discussing anything to do with the, with the interconnect or, or storage systems. So let's think about processors to begin with. Uh, so the basic functionality, obviously, to execute instructions to perform arithmetic operations, so be that integer or floating point, to load data from memory and store data back to memory, uh, and to follow the control flow through the program to describe, decide what instructions to execute next. Um, so arithmetic is performed on values in registers which is the local storage inside the processor. And moving data between memory and registers has to be done explicitly by load and store instructions. Um, there are separate sets of integer and floating point registers. And so a typical size is about 100 values. The AMD ROMs are a bit bigger than that. So I think it's an order of 140 for integer plus uh, 160 for, for, for floating point. And usually the basic characteristics we, we think about for, for processes are the clock speed and, and the peak floating point capability. Um, of course, those are absolutely not the whole story, um, but we'll come, up, we'll come to that later. So the clock speed determines the rate at which instructions are, are executed and modern processors are, uh, have kind of been stuck for, for quite a while now at around the two to three gigahertz clock rate. Um, so we'll discuss this in more detail. There's, within that, there's, there's some parallelism available we can execute in the same clock cycle. So for example, integer and floating point calculations can be done in parallel. Uh, we can also have uh, you know, uh, simultaneous adds and multiplies going on. Um, so, but the, the peak flop rate is, is, is just the product of the clock, clock rate with the number of floating, operation, floating point operations per clock cycle that the, that the hardware can do. Uh, and then there's a whole series of hardware innovations uh, which we'll touch on. So things like pipelining, out of order execution, speculative computation, and so on, um, to, to make everything run as, as, as quickly as possible. Um, so you'll all be, no doubt, very well aware of Moore's law that uh, uh, informally says that uh, CPU power doubles every, every 18 months. Uh, I mean, strictly speaking, that's, that, uh, that applies to transistor density. Uh, you know, it held true for at least 40 years, which is you know, quite remarkable in, if you think about it for a bit longer. Um, and people have predicted its demise many times. Uh, but now it's, you know, it seems that that is actually happening. This, uh, this doubling every 18 months is, is, uh, is, is starting to slow down. In, you know, up until, say, 10 to 15 years ago, uh, increases in processing power were, uh, were mainly due to increases in the clock rate. These days, most of the increase in processing power comes from increase in parallelism. So the clock rates have been pretty much fixed for the last 10 years or more. Um, and that parallelism comes in various different forms. 
Um, there's some very fine grained parallelism, which is uh, essentially pipeline instructions. There's some medium grain parallelism at the, you know, that's, uh, you know, across multiple instructions, uh, which we'll talk about a bit more. So that's you know, concepts like superscalar processing, SIMD or vector processing, uh, and also hardware multi-threading. And then finally, we have the coarse grain parallelism, which is having multiple processes, multiple cores on, on a chip. Um, but really these days, the first two of those, the, the fine and medium grain parallelism seem to be pretty much exhausted. There's not much more that uh, can be got out of those. And you know, almost all the increase in transistors these days is now just being put into having more cores. So let's have a look a bit more detail about what's in a processor. Um, so start off with the, the things that are actually doing the calculations, which are the functional units. Um, and the, so the core units that you'll find in any, any processor design are, are as follows. So first of all, we have the instruction unit. So this is responsible for fetching decoding and dispatching of instructions. So this is what gets the instructions from the instruction caches. It will then decode that instruction. So there's a bit of work to be done in the hardware to figure out what the instruction means and then sends those off to the appropriate unit to be executed. Instruction unit may also have some responsibility for scheduling instructions for, for essentially deciding uh, in what order and on what clock cycle the instructions are being executed. Then we have the units where the actual calculation is happening. So we have integer unit, which handles integer arithmetic, so addition, multiplication, division, all the logical operations, you know, things like and, or, bit shifts, and so on. So you also see this referred to as a, an ALU, arithmetic and logic unit. And then perhaps you know, most crucially for uh, is the floating point unit that handles floating point arithmetic. So multiplication, division, in some cases also uh, reciprocal and square root. Uh, and that's usually the critical resource for our performance computing. So you know, we all know that machines get sold and advertised by their, by their peak flop rates. Other units, we have a control unit, which is responsible for branches and jumps in the code. So essentially for deciding which instructions will get executed next. It's not the, the ones simply in sequence. Uh, it's a load store unit, which is what gets the data from memory into the register files uh, and stores it back again. And then the register file itself. So this is local storage in the CPU. Um, so this is, uh, so it's, so these are accessed by name and not address. So the, the register file does not for, is separate from the memory system. Okay, so the, the, uh, the memory system, which is all accessed by address, we are basically making copies of data from the memory system into the register file, doing arithmetic operations on values in the register file, and then storing those back into the memory system again. And then there's a whole, there may be a whole lot of other stuff on the, on the chip as well. Okay, um, so let's look through these different layers of parallelism. So I was starting from the from the bottom up. Um, so so that's essentially what's what's called pipelining. So this is a this is actually a key implementation technique for making fast CPUs. Uh, 
And the way this works is that the execution of instructions is broken down into stages. So a single instruction consists of multiple stages and each of those stages can be executed in one CPU clock cycle. And for the vast majority of hardware designs, all parts of the CPU operate at a fixed frequency. So all the units uh, on the chip are all operating, uh, all do something, some of some their basic operations at the same frequency. And the idea here is that once a stage is completed for one instruction, it can be executed for the next instruction on the subsequent clock cycle. So what that does is it allows one instruction to be completed on every clock cycle, even though the instruction itself may take many cycles to complete. Okay, um, so different instructions have consist of different numbers of stages, and the, the AMD Rome has a has a 19 stage pipeline. So the longest instructions are uh, the longest instruction can be as 19 stages. Um, uh, most of them are a fair bit shorter than that, um, but in principle, a, a, a an instruction can take 19 clock cycles from 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 start to finish. So most of this is in a very low level, very transparent to us as programmers, but probably the most important thing to be aware of is that not all instructions are pipelined. Um, so in particular, floating point square root and floating point divide instructions are typically not pipelined. So that means that they are, uh, they take many stages, but you can only have one of those in flight at a time. So um, that means that you know, they, are, they are typically expensive things to have in your code. And um, you know, we can think, maybe need to think about trying to minimize the numbers of square roots and divide instructions that, that are executed. The compiler will do a certain amount for us, um, but sometimes that requires uh, manual code rewriting. Anyway, that's looking ahead a bit. So this part is very neat, um, but it doesn't always, essentially it doesn't always work, okay? Because there can be events that result in stopping and restarting the pipeline. Uh, and wasting clock cycles as a result. So things that might cause this are if two instructions both require the same hardware resource on the same clock cycle, okay, hopefully both the compiler and the hardware conspire that that doesn't happen very much. Second one is perhaps more, more crucial and the one instruction depends the result of another instruction further down the pipeline. So if we have dependencies between instructions then that can, can break the pipelining. And finally, there is, if the result of an instruction changes which instruction to execute next, so in other words, branches, then that can also potentially stop the pipeline. So the hardware tries to do a lot of work under the hood to prevent these bad things from happening. Um, so a couple of things that are going on that you really can't see. Um, first of these is out of order execution. So you know, when you compile your code into assembly code, that effectively specifies an order in which your instructions are supposed to be executed in some sense, okay? Um, or at least, you know, if you, if you execute them in that order, then you have a correct program. Um, but the hardware itself may then choose to reorder those instructions as they fetch from the instruction cache to try to minimize pipeline stores. So this requires quite a lot of complicated bookkeeping to make sure that correctness is maintained. And so that, uh, so that none of this reordering can affect the, the result of the program. Um, 
The other thing that's happening is branch prediction. So the hardware tries to guess which way the next branch will go. Uh, and essentially what it's doing is using a hardware table that tracks the outcomes of recent branches in the code um, to make an in informed guess. Uh, and what it does is that it gets, so it guesses which way the branch is going to go. It keeps executing uh, the instructions going down that branch uh, and keeps the pipeline going. Uh, and it only, it, it'll only stall the pipeline if that prediction turns out to be wrong in which case it has to cancel a bunch of sort of, of, of instructions that are halfway through the pipeline and haven't finished yet uh, you know, to make sure that the, none of the effects of those half executed instructions ever get seen. So for us, scientific code tends on the whole not to be very branchy. Uh, and if you know, most of the branches are in fact the, the branch back to the beginning of a loop, which is very highly predictable. So um, for the purposes of scientific codes, then branch prediction is not necessarily all that important. Um, there's a fair amount of hardware dedicated to it um, because you know, these processes are designed as purpose processes. Um, but in fact, you know, a lot of that is probably probably as somewhat wasted on, on scientific codes. Okay, uh, let's move up a level then. So instruction level parallelism. Um, so if you can, you can think of pipelining as a form of instruction level parallelism because multiple instructions are in flight at the same time, but the maximum performance you get from, from just from pipelining is one instruction per cycle. So it's also possible to ins exploit instruction level parallelism at a higher level to identify instructions that can be executed independently. Uh, and essentially, these are typically ones that use different functional units. OK, so there's no point trying to schedule two instructions that use the same functional unit uh, on, on the same clock cycle because that one is going to have to wait for the other. So this is this is trying to uh, trying to identify instructions which can be done uh, independently in parallel on different functional units. Two main approaches to this, uh, and I wanted to do both. Okay, so the first one is superscalar processing. So these are parallel instructions are identified at runtime in the hardware. So this is all kind of folded in with the out of order execution engine. So not only is the uh, not only is the instruction unit deciding um, which instruction, what order instructions are doing, and it's also deciding which ones can go in parallel and on the same clock cycle, uh, and taking care of all the all the instruction scheduling and bookkeeping that needs to to happen to make that make your program run correctly. Second approach, which is also important, is uh, SIMD or vector instructions. So this is where we have operations on multiple data items encoded in a single instruction. Um, but there's very there's fairly tight restrictions on on what uh, what can be done there. So essentially, it has to be all the same operation on different bits of data, and there's you know, there's limitations, which we'll, we'll talk about much more later on in the course. Okay, um, I think I've maybe covered most of this. So superscalar processes, yep, they're dividing instructions up into classes which uses use different resources. So the most obvious one would be integer and floating point. Uh, also load stores. Um, uh, so for example, if you have two more instructions are in different classes, they can be issued on the same clock cycle and proceed in, in parallel. So for example, you could do an integer add and a floating point multiply in the same cycle. And as I, as I mentioned, this can be all folded in with the out of order execution engine. Um, okay, a bit more details. The, yeah, so essentially what's going on here is that instead of fetching instructions one at a time, the, the hardware fetches several instructions once, 
and, and then does a sort of complete scheduling job on that batch of instructions. So most of this is going on in the hardware. Um, it can be somewhat helped by the compiler, by the compiler choosing to group instructions together in ways that make it easier for, for the for the hardware to, to discover that parallelism. Um, so the compiler is not completely out of the picture in this process. And the simple instructions, so these are the ones which encode operations on multiple data items. Um, so for example, a, a simple and ordinary floating point instruction might encode for C equals A plus B, but a SIMD floating point instruction could encode for uh, two such operations. So each C equals A plus B and F equals D plus E in a, in a single instruction. Um, so most modern processes include support for these. Um, so um, uh, various AVX standards in, in x86 and x86 clones like the, like the AMDs. Uh, but then other architectures, uh, so um, so things like ARM supports a different set of instructions, which is called SVE and so on, and, and NEO. Um, so these require a substantial extension to the instruction set. Um, so we typically have SIMD loads and stores and SIMD compares, as well as all the, the integer and floating point arithmetic. It obviously requires uh, replication of the arithmetic units uh, and also some uh, some vector registers to take advantage of them. Um, though in fact on modern processors like the, the MD Rome, the uh, floating point registers are, are, are all vector registers in effect. Um, so a bit of terminology here, the SIMD width is the number of operations encoded in a SIMD instruction. So that's, you know, that would be typically two, four, or eight. Um, so that depends on the, the number of bits that the SIMD instruction uh, supports uh, and also the data type that you're operating on. So this all sounds great. Um, but there are, you know, there are restrictions on what SIMD operations can do. Uh, so, for, uh, so particularly for the loads and word SIMD load of double precision values may require that, for example, that those values are consecutive in memory and are correctly aligned on a, on a 16 byte boundary. So you can't just replace, you can't just pack any old loads and stores into, into SIMD, SIMD operations. Uh, and in this case, it's the compiler that's responsible for, the, for, the, for identifying the operations which can be combined together into SIMD instructions. Uh, and in practice, this is a tough job for the compiler. Um, and we'll talk a lot more about this tomorrow. Um, but the, so, the sort of problems that, are, uh, that, are, that the compiler has is that, for example, the alignment of data, the byte alignment of data is often not determinable at compile time. Okay, and the compiler just doesn't know. Um, so, you know, the compiler can potentially generate multiple versions of the code and pick the right one depending on the alignment encountered at runtime. But uh, that's, uh, that works in some cases, but not, but not always. Um, so you know, sometimes as programmers, we, 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 we need to intervene a bit to get the, to get the SIMD instructions working as well as possible. Okay, so it's kind of a lightning tour of instruction level parallelism. Let's move up a level, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to I, I'll come back to hardware melting later. So I haven't forgotten about that. Okay, um, so it's now looking. We're now going to look at you know, the highest level of parallelism, which is multi-core. So it's now you know absolutely ubiquitous to have lots of cores on a chip. Uh, 
and uh, typically each core has its, some of its own cache memory, um, but the last level cache, level three cache, is, is shared between some cores. Um, it's also, there have also been some arguably not very successful designs or designs which are, for, which are not targeted necessarily at high performance computing, where, not, where cores share functional units as well. Um, so there have been designs in the past where you have two cores that share some floating point units. Uh, and you know, they, the operation of those floating point units gets divided up somehow between the, between the cores, yeah, possibly dyna probably dynamically. But uh, yeah, so there are, there, there are designs like that, but uh, they're, they're not great for high performance computing, so you tend not to see them very much. Okay, so this is a schematically, this is your, your, your typical uh, cache hierarchy. Something's got, <coughs> something's gone wrong with my diagram here. Okay, so in fact, um, this, this box that indicates the chip should encompass all the, the cores, the level one caches and, and level three, only, only main memory is, is off the chip. Sorry about that. It's, PDF conversion is broken a bit, I think. I need to go and fix that. Okay, um, so yeah, typically you have lots of cores, each with a level one and level two cache, and then and then sh share some share some level three cache. Okay. And uh, um, the the level three cache structure in the AMD ROMs is unusual, and we will talk a fair bit about that later on. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, it essentially means that you know multiple cores on the same chip can communicate with each other with uh, with pretty low latency and high bandwidth, because this is happening by reads and writes which are which are cached in the shared cache. Um, on the other hand, the you know, cores will also contend for space in that shared cache, so you know, a thread may suffer from cache misses caused by threads or processes on another core. Um, and so in some sense, that makes it harder to have precise control as a programmer over what data is in the cache. And also, if, you, if we only have a single access to the whole shared cache, so uh, we need to bear that in mind when we're doing scalability and um, uh, experiments. Um, because you know, a, a single core has, a, has access to more than its fair share of resources if there's nothing else running. And importantly as well, the cores also share the off-chip bandwidth for access to, access to main memory. And again, that's a, that's a very important feature which we'll talk a lot more about. Okay, so now I want to head towards ideas about uh, hardware multi-threading. Uh, and this is basically in, in, in motivated by the fact that in practice, uh, a lot of instruction slots get left empty. So although you know, we have these superscalar processors that can issue several instructions on every clock cycle, uh, a, a typical process is maybe you know, four, five, six instructions per clock going to different functional units. Um, but obviously, there the, 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 the must be no dependencies between the instructions that get issued on the same clock cycle. The problem is that typical applications don't have that much inherent instruction parallelism in them. So if you measure you know, how much how, you know, look at a typical application and say, okay, on average, how many instructions are available at any one time to be executed in parallel um, because they don't depend on each other, um, then the answer is somewhere in the region of one and a half or two. So what that normally means is if we have a single thread of execution running, then 
uh, in practice, probably more than half the available instruction slots uh, are actually at any one time are actually empty. So there's no, you know, not filling up all the, we're not executing all the possible instructions that the core could execute. So the idea of simultaneous multi-threading um, is, so this is also, uh, it's also quite widely called hyper-threading, but that's actually an Intel proprietary term. So for, at least for the purpose of this course, I should, uh, should, should try to avoid using it. But you know, hyper-threading, simultaneous multi-threading, hardware multi-threading, these all essentially all refer to the same technique. Okay, so what this tries to do is to fill those spare slots by mixing the instructions from more than one thread of execution in the same clock cycle. And this requires some replication of hardware, um, but you know, uh, but not that much. Okay, so you know, about so maybe about five percent of the chip area is, is dedicated to, to this feature. But most things are shared between these threads: so the functional units, the register files, all the memory system, including all the caches, and so on. For most architectures, though, this doesn't scale up particularly uh, to large numbers of threads. Okay, so you know, mostly you'll see that the support is for maybe two or four threads per core. Okay, so it's a little diagram to, to try and illustrate that. So um, here on the left, um, basically have a, uh, the idea here is that we have a processor with five instruction slots available. Okay, so those the instruction slots go across the diagram here and time goes down. So each of these blocks represents a, each row represents a clock cycle. Okay, so we've got five instruction slots going across. And in this example, we've got six clock cycles going down. Okay, and so so maybe for a for a, for a given program, um, we have, we have you know, two threads running on separate CPUs. This may be the pattern in which the instruction slots are at, can actually get filled. So this is so you'll see that you know so we've used this idea that you know maybe at least half of those uh, instruction slots are actually white, so nothing is being executed. Um, however, we basically allow those those two patterns to get folded on top of each other, um, and so those those same two threads that that set those set of instructions on the right here can can actually make better use of the instruction units. So now we have you know, both blue both instructions from the blue thread and the red thread being executed on the same clock cycle. Uh, of course, there may not be perfectly parallelism. So this perfect parallelism or perfect overlapping. So in this case, those, you know, those set of instructions actually take seven. You need actually seven clock cycles rather than six to get through those two sets of instructions. Okay. But that's, uh, that's, a significant, that's a potentially significant improvement. In practice, everything's not so not so rosy as that. Um, how successful is it? Well, it depends on the application and how the threads threads contend for the shared resources. In practice, the best you know, if you have two hardware thread, two or more hardware threads, the best you ever seem to really get is about a sort of 1.2 or 1.3 times speed up over a single thread. Um, and the benefits will be limited if, if both threads are using the same functional units intensively. So if, you know, if I have two threads which are both saturating the floating point unit, so for example, they're doing you know, dense matrix matrix multiplies, um, then, then you're not going to get any benefit because we've already, you know, that hardware resource is already saturated by, by a single thread and there aren't any, uh, there aren't any free floating point instructions um, so the fact that there may be other 
blank instruction slots doesn't help um, because they are, you know, it's the, the floating point instructions are the critical resource. And in fact, for some codes, using SMT can actually cause slowdown. Um, it's partly because you have increased contention for memory bandwidth or cache space. So you can end up having, you can end up getting more cache misses by having hardware threads running. Um, but for, you know, more generally in for large scale parallel programs that we're, that we're interested in, then, uh, you know, in order to exploit SMT, then we need to explicitly increase the number of threads or processes. You know, so that could be, you know, you might have to, you might need to double the number of OpenMP threads or double the number of MPI processes uh, that you're running with. Um, but that can increase over, lead to increased overheads such as additional communication or load imbalance. So the large scale parallel overheads that you pay um, may not outweigh the, the benefits that you get from having the, the multiple threads executing. So you'll, you'll, you'll quite often find that a lot of HPC system installations disable SMT by default and you have to, you have to request it specifically. Okay, um, yeah, accelerators. So uh, we're not going to talk about accelerators in this course. Um, they are increasingly important, um, but so for the Arch2 service, we've chosen not to have, uh, have an accelerated system. Um, so I'm well, basically not going to not going to discuss those in, in this course. Okay, so that's a very quick tour of processes. Um, anybody have any questions before I move on to talking more about memory? Okay, but please feel free to, to chip in with, with questions in the chat at, uh, at any point. Okay, so memory. Um, so um, memory performance is often really the limiting factor for HPC applications rather than the core performance or processor performance uh, because you know, the the bottleneck is actually getting keeping the CPU fed with data rather than actually doing the arithmetic processing. Uh, and it's uh, you know, memory's um, a substantial contributor to the cost of systems. Um, so you know, typical HPC systems have a few gigabytes of memory per core. Um, uh, it's technically possible to have a lot more than that, um, but that's uh, that's too expensive and power hungry. Okay, this question from Andre. Is oversubscribing to logical cores related to multi-threading in any way? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so yes, that's another piece of terminology for 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 hardware multi-threading is is logical cores. Okay, so um, that's you know when you're if you look at your system and it tells you that you have uh, uh, so it tells you have eight logical cores, um, but you have only have four physical cores. Then what that means is that each physical core is able to support two hardware threads. Yeah. So it's, it's exactly the same thing. It's just talked about in, in many different, there's too much confusing terminology here. Okay, so the things we care about in memory system are latency. Uh, how long you, if a processor asks for data from memory, how long does it take to, to get it back? Uh, and then bandwidth is the sustained rate at which data can be, can be fed from, from memory into the processor. 
So you know, for a, for a single, if we think about a single core, then the ballpark figures are you know, so hundreds of nanosecond orders, hundred nanoseconds for latency to main memory, and you know, a few gigabytes a second per core. So perhaps if you haven't thought it very much, very much about it, that latency figure of 100 nanoseconds might seem quite large, and it is. Okay, main memory latencies are long, and in terms of if we're counting, counting in processor clock cycles, then it's you know, hundreds, maybe two to three hundred processor clock cycles to fetch a piece of data from main memory. So fetching data from main memory is something like two orders of magnitude slower than, than doing arithmetic. Um, so if we only just had main memory and processors, that would be a serious problem. So the solution to that is, is this idea of cache memory. Um, so what, what is, is, is memory which is much faster to access in terms of latency than main memory uh, and also has by higher bandwidth as well, but it's much smaller than main memory. And what it does is it keeps copies of recently used data, which can then be re-accessed quickly. As, and as we've seen, modern systems have this hierarchy of you know, typically three levels of cache, uh, on, on chip these days. Um, so to so put some numbers on it, this is what our, our memory hierarchy looks like. And so at, uh, at the top here, we have the CPU. Um, so this, the storage of the CPU is the registers. So there's you know, kind of order of a kilobyte of storage, which can be accessed in, in one clock cycle. And we go down to the level one cache. So that might be the order of 100 kilobytes and with a, you know, a handful of cycles, clock cycles to access it. Level two cache, uh, a few megabytes and maybe something like 20 cycles. Level three cache, tens of megabytes, and 50 cycles-ish. Uh, and then all the way down to main memory where we have gigabytes of storage um, but it takes you know, maybe an order of 200 clock cycles to, to access the data. So we've ended up with modern processor design the hierarchy. So as we go as we go down the memory hierarchy, the capacity increases, but the the the, um, the speed decreases. The speed of access uh, decreases as we go down. So caches are quite sophisticated bits of hardware, um, essentially because we're making, what the caches are doing are making potentially many copies of memory locations in the hardware. Um, so you need to, it all needs to keep track of where the most up-to-date copy is and to flush old data downwards to make space for new data coming in from main memory. Okay. So all this is done completely automatically in the sense that it's transparent to the CPU. So none of this data movement uh, is in any way explicit in your program. So your program, even at the assembly code level, still sees this simple register memory model. It doesn't know anything about all, all the caches. The important thing to realize here is that caches only help performance if the application reuses recently accessed data. And although there's a certain amount that the compiler can do to help you here, it's mostly our responsibility as programmers to order computations in order to maximize this reuse. And as we'll come back to later, Modern systems also do prefetching as well. 
so what this means is that the harder is making uh, typically very simple guesses as to what data is about to be requested by the CPU and to load those to preload that data into the caches before the processor actually makes the makes the request for. Okay, so a bit of theory or terminology, if you like, here. Uh, it's just the principle of locality. Okay, so almost every program exhibits some degree of locality, have a tendency to reuse recently accessed data. Uh, and this comes in, in two forms. Uh, so the first of these is, is locality in time or temporal locality. So, a recent, so all that is saying is that a recently accessed item is likely to be reused in the near future. So, for example, if X is read now, then it's likely to be read again or written soon. And the second type of locality is spatial locality, which says that items with nearby addresses tend to be accessed close together in time. Okay? So, for example, if, I, if, I, if YI is read now, it's quite likely that YI plus one is going to be, is going to be read soon. So cache is trying to help by holding copies of data from main memory locations. Um, so, because you know, fetching an item of cache is much quicker than fetching it from, from main memory. But in order to make that cache faster and affordable and not take up too much silicon, that cache is much smaller than main memory. Okay. Uh, a bit of a bit more terminology. Uh, so uh, a cache block is the unit of data which can be transferred from main memory into the cache and, and back again. And so normally this is the order of a few words. So typically 32, 64, 128 bytes. Again, historical reasons. Um, there's multiple terms of terminology here. Cache block is also sometimes called a cache line. Um, you'll hear both used. They, they mean exactly the same thing. I'll try to stick to calling them blocks, but I, but I may fail. If I talk about cache lines, then I'm talking about exactly the same thing. So where do they get cached? Well, they are always cached on reads, except in special circumstances. So if a memory location is read by the processor and there isn't a, a copy in the cache, so that would be what's called a read miss, then the data will get cached. Okay. Write's more complicated. We'll, we'll come back to that. So where does the data go? Well, the cache is divided into sets. Uh, and a set is just a group of blocks. Um, so again, typical numbers, four, eight, 16 blocks in a set. And the terminology that you probably have heard here is that if we have eight blocks per set, then that's what's called an eight-way set associative cache. So if we want to cache the contents of address, then basically what we do is we just basically look at some of the bits in the address. We effectively ignore the last n bits, where two to the n is the block size, because that just that's just an index within the block. So we ignore the, the low end bits. Um, and then computer set index as the high end bits modulo the number of sets in the cache. Okay, so that's just picking out the next m bits from the address where two to the n is the number of sets. So ignore the bottom bits and look at the next set of the next chunk of bits, uh, and that gives us the, the set index. And then data is allowed to go to any block in that set. Okay, so example here. So suppose we had a 
32 kilobyte cache with 32 byte blocks and two blocks per set. Okay, so that would mean that we can, okay, so here's the diagram of our cache on the right here. So each block is 32 bytes wide and these blocks are paired up. So every two blocks makes up a set. Um, so down the left hand side there we have the set index. So for a 32 byte cache with this block size and set size, we'd have 512 different sets. Okay. So suppose the data we're looking at has this address. Um, then essentially, we'd need, so 32 bytes, so two to the, uh, 32 is two to the five. So we ignore the bottom end five bits and 512 is two to the nine. So we look at the next nine bits, okay? So that is the value of these bits in the address tells us which set that data is going to be cached in, okay? Um, so that turns out to be decimal 412, okay? So the data at this address will be cached in set 412, but it can be stored in either of the two blocks in, in that set. Okay, um, so once we choose a set, then we have to choose a block in that set to store the new data. And the old contents of that block get, get overwritten. Um, the normal policy is, or roughly, uh, roughly speaking, is what's called least recently used. So uh, what happens is that the, we'll replace the block in the set, which has been unused for the longest time. Okay? and the hardware keeps track of that. So this is basically trying to exploit the principle of locality. The least recently used block is less likely to be used again soon, okay? It doesn't matter, it, doesn't, it might not be, but, but on average, it, it probably will be, okay? Um, so that's roughly the, roughly the scheme. Some additional sophistication is, is possible and is present in, in a lot of uh, in a lot of caching, but roughly speaking, it's the it's the least recently used block that gets thrown out. So why do we do things like this? Well, it basically means finding data in the cache is easy. Okay. So you press the cache has to check whether it has the data or not. So for a given address, what the, uh, basically what the cache has to do is to find the set where it might be cached. So again, that's just this process of looking at those, that middle chunk of bits. Okay. So, so each block has an address tag stored with it. So as well as the data, we also store the high end bits, the left end, left end bits. So all the cache has to do uh, to determine whether it contains a piece of data or not is look at those middle bits, the set index, search through all the blocks in that set, okay, so that's not very many of them, and uh, look at all the blocks in that set and see if the address of the requested data matches the address of anything that's stored in that, in that set. Okay, so back to writes. So in most applications, writes happen less often than reads. Uh, and there's two basic strategies we can do here. Okay? First of these is called write through. Okay? So if, if the processor writes some values to a piece of data, then we write through that the, both the cache block and the copy and main memory will be updated straight away. And in that case, normally don't bother caching on a miss, okay? So you, would, you don't bring the data into the cache first, only, if only just to modify it 
and then propagate that change back to main memory as well. The change just goes, goes straight through to main memory if the, if the block was not already in the cache. The other possibility is write back. So this means that the, the data is the, the write only, the modification only happens to the, to the cached copy in the cache block. Uh, and then the copy back to main memory happens only when that block is replaced by some, by some new data coming into that set. So there's an extra bit uh, used to indicate when that's necessary. So uh, if the, if obviously if, that, if none of the data is actually in that block has actually been changed, then there's no need to do the copy back because main memory already has an up-to-date copy. And in this case, you normally would, we normally would cache on a miss. Okay, so if the data is not in the cache, then fetch the old copy from main memory, do the modification to the, to the cached copy, and then the propagation of that value, that new value back to main memory doesn't happen until sometime later when that block gets thrown out. Okay, and there's various advantages and disadvantages to this. Um, you know, essentially, um, you know, there are there are pros and cons to both of these. Okay, which I'll, I'll kind of skip over for the sake of time here. But let's think about what's going on from the processor's point of view. Okay, all this machinery is essentially invisible to the processor. The assembly code is scheduled assuming the data is in the level one cache. Okay. Um, so if it's not, then the processor has to wait until the data is found and loaded. The processor can continue executing other instructions, um, but there's, there, there's a limit on the number of outstanding memory references that the processor can keep track of. And once that limit's exceeded, then the processor will come to a stop okay, and won't execute any more instructions until uh, at least one of those memory references actually returns uh, a value into, into registers. Okay, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the discussion of, of virtual memory here. And okay, I'm going to excuse that by saying, okay, um, most supercomputers, okay, so this is the idea that you know you can spill out into onto the disk. Um, so that's you know that's what happens in desktop and laptop systems, but typically supercomputers don't do this. Okay. Um, I'll also skip over TLB discussion as well because, yeah, TLBs are still in modern processors, but they're now so big that TLB misses are, are rarely an issue. So, don't really have to worry about those too much these days. Okay, we talked a little about prefetching before. Okay, so another way of reducing the cache miss rate is to try and load data into the cache before the load's actually issued. Um, so this is fine, okay, but the hardware, the hardware is keeping, keeping uh, track of outstanding, outstanding prefetches. Um, and we have this limit on the number of outstanding misses which are, which are possible. Okay, so hardware prefetching is typically very simple, okay? So it's basically just assuming that, it's assuming perfect temporal locality. In other words, that you know, whenever a block, whenever a cache block is loaded, the hardware assumes that the next block in memory, so the next block in sequence in, in address space, is going to be accessed soon. So we'll go ahead and load that anyway before the processor requests it. Okay, um, so that works some of the time. Okay, uh, we can have multiple streams of data operating at the same time. So you know, consecutive uh, consecutive blocks being loaded 
from a from multiple different base addresses. Um, but obviously, this only works if our program has regular data access patterns. Okay? So if your program is running through a, a vector in order, this will work very well. If your program is has indirect addressing or lots of pointer chasing, and you're pulling in data from all the, or in a, lots of different widely scattered addresses, then prefetching just won't help you at all. Uh, it's also possible that the compiler can try and do something here and put prefetch instructions into the into your code. Um, but typically, you know, short answer is, well, that doesn't actually work very well. So let's not worry about it. And in terms of cache, yep, we have uh, you know multiple levels in cache. Um, this complicates the hardware somewhat. Um, so basically what it means is that we need this principle of inclusion. Uh, everything that's stored in the level one cache, for example, must also be in the level two as well um, in order to make keeping track of everything uh, tractable. And then with multi-core processors, this, uh, this problem of having multiple copies gets a lot more complicated. Uh, so that's, that requires this notion of cache coherency. Um, so essentially that's, you know, for uh, the, the processor is trying to support a, a shared memory parallel programming model across multiple cores. And that program is so a basic assumption of that programming model is that a shared variable has a unique value at any given time. But having all these caches means that there may actually be you know, physically multiple copies of that memory location in the hardware. And um, so the hardware has to avoid two processors caching different values of the same memory location. Um, and thinking that, that they are both valid. So as a one line here, okay, to achieve what happens to achieve this is that whenever a write happens to a memory location, all the other copies of that location have to be removed from the caches that they are in to make sure that other cores cannot use out of date data. And there's various ways that we implement. So there's two different types of protocol here. One is the sort of simple one is called snooping protocol, where uh, every cache block carries some information around with it, which describes its sharing status. You know, is this has this block been modified? Is this block currently stored in more than one cache? And the second one is directory based, where this information is is uh, is stored centrally in a directory, and that's usually in alongside the block in main memory. So again, there's a cost to that operation, and talk more about that when we talk tomorrow about you know, optimizing shared memory programs. Um, and I'll also talk about, I'll also come back and talk about this issue here, okay, which is, which is false sharing. So this is a, this is a problem that happens because these coherency operations are performed on entire cache blocks. Okay? So this notion of invalidating copies of data in other caches, this is all happening in units of cache blocks. And the fact that you can have multiple words of data in a single cache block gives this gives rise to this this problem. So you know, what you have to think about here is have two processes, two cores, uh, and they're both writing to different words that happen to be near enough in memory that they're on the same cache line. Ah, oh, I've done it. Okay, cache block 
So logically, there's no data values being shared by the processors. But what happens is that each write will invalidate the copy in the other processor's cache. So that causes a lot of traffic and memory accesses and, and will slow down your whole program. Okay. And as we'll come, we'll talk about this, it can be a can be a, a problem for, for threaded programmers, but, but typically doesn't affect message passing. And uh, um, we'll discuss why later. Okay, so this also now brings us on to distributed shared memory. Okay. Um, because you know, uh, essentially uh, you can't put, uh, you can't go expanding and putting many, many processes attached to the same memory in, indefinitely. Um, so basically have is this notion of distributed shared memory machines, which are designed to sort of scale to large numbers of processes, but also retain this you know, shared memory programming model in a single address space. Um, so this is happening inside a node to a very limited extent, because uh, for you know, if you look at almost all current HPC systems, almost every system has nodes with two sockets in it. Okay, so every socket contains a processor with a bunch of cores plus some main memory. Okay, um, so concept, but conceptually, what we've got is an architecture where main memory is split up and there is some subset of processes or cores attached to, to each piece of memory. Okay. So we do have to care about this. We do have these small scale distributed shared memory systems going on inside, inside a node. Um, and the way that memory is organized here is that every memory address is allocated a fixed location. Okay. Um, again, this, the, the, the node terminology is being, being abused here. Okay. Um, it's, this is a home, this is a, a, a memory node, if you like, not a computing node. Sorry about that. Okay, and this is term, again just terminology. This is called a cache coherent non uniform memory architecture or CC NUMA system sometimes. So, this is where this word NUMA comes from non uniform memory architecture. So, the main problem is that accesses to remote memories take longer than local memory. Um, so, but it's difficult to detect allocated given page on. So the operating system is responsible for allocating memory pages. So within a, within a compute node, it has choices about which piece of main memory data is actually stored in. And basically there are some, some common operating system policies for that. Uh, the most important one is first touch um, because basically that's the default policy in Linux. Um, and that basically says, okay, whichever node, okay, again, this is memory node, NUMA node, first accesses that page, that's where that data will live in main memory for the entire lifetime of the application. Oh, again, so tomorrow we'll talk about, you know, talk about shared memory programs. We'll talk about the consequences of, of NUMA, numa -ness. Okay, so this brings on to a bit, something a bit more concrete. This is the, this is the node architecture for, for Archer 2. Okay, so each node has two AMD Rome processors. And these, each processor has, in fact, has 64 cores. Uh, and these are, these come in essentially in, in groups of eight. Okay. Um, physically in groups of eight, which turns out uh, somewhat strangely not to be an important number. Okay. I'll, we'll talk about, talk about that, why that is in, in, 
in, in a minute. Uh, so, okay, so there's eight groups of, physically there are eight groups of eight cores, and there are also eight banks of, of main memory, making up totals of, uh, total of 100, so uh, basically two lots of, two lots of 64 gig, um, but divide, divided up, okay. Um, so that gives us our 120, uh, gives us our 128 gig in the whole, in the whole, uh, whole node. Hi, Cedric, do you want to ask something? No, it was a mistake, sorry. Okay, no problem. Okay, so some let's put some numbers on, on this. Okay, so it's uh, yeah, MD Rome, uh, unofficially, officially MD Epic 7742. 64 cores, uh, so base clock rates of 2.25 gigahertz. Each core has two floating point vector units, uh, which supports fused multiply add uh, operations. Uh, it supports 256-bit wide AVX vector instructions. Uh, so in other words, one vector instruction can encode for four double precision floating point operations or eight single precision. Okay. Um, so that gives us a so two units. FMA gives us two flops, four wide vector of SIMD width of four gives us, so two times two times four gives us this peak of 16 flops per clock. Okay, so that translates to 36 gigaflops per second per core, um, or 2.3 teraflops per second per socket, or 4.6 teraflops per second per node. Okay. Uh, does support hardware multi-threading in so, but just two hardware threads per core. And in terms of the memory hierarchy, each core has its own level one cache, which is 32 kilobytes, eight-way set associative, and 64 byte lines, and its own level two cache, 512 kilobytes, also eight-way set associative, and 64 byte lines. And then the crucial, uh, or the probably the most important two processor, which make it particularly different from Intel architectures. And that's first of all is the level three cache structure. So each set of four cores shares a level three cache. Okay, so. Uh, cores are divided, so 64 cores, we have 16 separate level three caches, each with four cores attached to it. And each of those level three caches is 16 megabytes and 16 way assessors, associative and 64 byte lines. And so that's four megabytes of core of level three cache. Okay, so that's one important distinction between the, the AMD ROMs and Intel processors. All of those, most of the current Intel designs have, um, have a single level three cache across all cores. Second important thing about memory is that, there, so out from the 256 gigabyte per main, main memory, uh, there are, that's divided up into eight of these NUMA regions. So that's four per socket. So that means that every set of 16 cores essentially has its own local main memory attached to it. So again, that's different from Intel processors, which typically are just one NUMA region per socket. 
The memory bandwidth amounts to about three gigabytes per second per core if all the cores are being used simultaneously. Okay. Um, which is actually slightly on the low side compared to some other current processor designs. So the total memory bandwidth is, is not, or the memory band, at least the memory bandwidth per core is not particularly large. And that is a limiting factor for some applications. Okay, and then finally the memory latencies. Okay, so level one is you know, around four clock cycles, level two around 12, level three 39 ish. Uh, and main memory uh, about 270. Okay. Yeah, so just to um, just to emphasize this, these numa regions. So yeah, the MD room is is uh, is un uh, is unusual in that it has uh, it has multiple memory regions per processor. Each of these have this 16 cores associated with it. Um, so that means that if you're not using all the cores, then you need to make sure that your, uh, your threads or processes are scattered about to, to maximize your memory bandwidth. So this also means, again, we'll come back to this. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, for hybrid codes, this memory structure needs to make needs to be uh, thought about sensibly. Okay, um, so we need to take care about that. You know, essentially, what we need is that all the threads associated with the same MPI process really need to be uh, executing in the same NUMA region for good performance. Okay, yeah, so, uh, so Adrian's doing a great job of answering Sachin's question. Yeah, so one, one NUMA region uh, has 16 cores and therefore four, there are four L3 caches in, in one NUMA region. Yeah. So the, the physical groups of eight cores turn out to be not important. So the important numbers are four cores per L3 cache and 16 cores per NUMA region. Okay, well, I'm afraid I've already completely blown away my timetable. Um, so what I suggest we do is take and if that's okay with you, come, come back and, and restart at um, at about 11.30, get us back on, try to get us back on track a bit. Um, and then we can also get into the practical sessions. Hi, Mark. Um, um, my apologies. No, okay. We'll, uh, um, we'll be, um, I'll, we'll do our best to keep more on, keep more to time. Okay, uh, uh, Lustin, is it? You're uh, slightly ahead of me here, so there is a, a slight um, announce, uh, change I need to make for the second exercise, uh, which uh, which Mark has just put in there in the uh, chat for me. Um, so there's a slight error or issue on the system at the moment where you can't actually load the performance uh, monitoring tools or the profiling tools in the way we would like. Um, and so you have to go through this slight rigmarole of unloading them and, and reloading them. I shall come on to that in a minute. Um, so just so we don't drift off schedule anymore, um, I think what I shall do now, uh, if, if everybody's okay with this, is start my next lecture. Um, and uh, we'll try and zip through it in good time so that we can come back and 
then do the um, practical uh, on time and finish at, uh, at one o'clock for for the lunch break. Uh, but let me know if you have any questions before we start the next lecture. Uh, this first exercise, the placement exercise, really was to do two things. It's it's a to give us you a chance to get on the system and for us to check whether you're having any problems running jobs, uh, whether you're having any problems accessing the system. So I'm hoping that you'll all have been able to log on and run a job um, and compile a code and all those kind of things. But if you haven't had it, uh, been able to do that, if you haven't haven't managed any of those steps, then do let us know uh, and we can help you out. Uh, and we have other helpers here in the session who can help you out um, whilst the lecture is going on as well, if, if, that, if that's uh, needed. Um, but also it was just to give you a little bit of uh, experience with the um, placement issues that Mark was talking about at the end of the last uh, lecture where the AMD uh, nodes and the AMD processors have uh, different performance characteristics than other processors in the sense that we have these uh, NUMA regions and, and performance can be higher in those NUMA regions and, and lower outside those for various activities. So the, the benchmark was, the benchmark we run here with streams is just a memory benchmark and what it's meant to be allow you to do is look at performance, memory bandwidth performance you can get from the processor uh, and if you can run it on varying numbers of uh, cores you know, on 16 or then on 32 uh, or 64, 128. And you can start to see some of the performance you can get from a single NUMA region and then across NUMA regions and from the whole node. Um, and hopefully that will give you a little bit of awareness of the uh, performance issues that Mark's already outlined, where to get the full memory bandwidth of a node, you need to use all those NUMA regions. And so this becomes important when you're running an application where you are you may be underpopulating so you're not using all the physical cores uh, so you may have to um, adjust your usage of a node so you use all those all those numer regions to get the full memory bandwidth out of the system are there any questions or people having any problems before i i, I try to do the to get through the next lecture I should have, and Mark did introduce me at the beginning, but my name is Adrian Jackson. I'm also a researcher at, at EPCC, um, and I'll be giving this lecture um, and practical, the one on profiling, but also um, some of the uh, content on vectorization and, and uh, memory hierarchies tomorrow as well. Okay, so if there's no questions, then what I'll I'll go on to now is a, is a lecture on profiling, uh, and so this is an important part of any performance optimization topic, because before you want to look at improving your code on a particular piece of hardware or on a particular system, it's also important to understand, you know, the performance of your code and where time is being spent in the code and which parts of the hardware are your, are your bottlenecks. Um, so you may want to optimize for Arch 2, but it's worth knowing where in the code you need to optimize, which routines uh, and which particular hardware features of Archer may be the, the reason that you're getting good or, or bad performance. Uh, is it in the memory? Is it the floating point? Is it the network? Is it the file system? And a key tool for doing this um, is uh, a profiling. So profiling is, 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 a, is, a, is the mechanism and the um, way of finding out where in your application time is being spent. Uh, and that's because uh, that's that useful for performance optimization because we want to know where we can best focus our effort or where we need to focus our effort in optimizing an application. So it could be that you think you've written your code, you know it well, you think all the time is, the runtime has been spent in a particular place, but actually on this piece of hardware, the time has been spent in, a, in another routine, in another place. Um, it, could also, uh, it could also be that um, you don't know where the application performance has been spent. So you've written the code or you're using somebody else's code and you're not really 
it's not really clear to you where most of the time is being spent and, and we need to focus on particular parts of the code to ensure we optimize the right place. And so um, in this example, you know, the, the, the idea is that there's no point in optimizing bits of a code which really don't contribute significantly to the overall runtime of your application. If you if you take a piece of a subroutine or a function in your code and you make it go 100 times faster, that's great, but only if that subroutine takes up a significant fraction of your runtime. If it's only responsible for say 5% of your overall runtime and you make it go 100 times faster, you're still only ever gonna make your application go 5% faster because you're optimizing a small part of it from a performance perspective. So what we're looking to do is profile code so that we can understand where the time is being spent and also at a deeper level understand what parts of the hardware we are um, using efficiently and what parts of the hardware we're not using efficient, uh, not using efficiently, uh, potentially, and uh, then use that to then guide what we do in the rest of our work. So profiling generally works uh, by instrumenting the code. So adding extra stuff into the code to collect performance data. This means it's usually done by the profile. And now you can go through your application yourself and you can add in uh, timing uh, function calls and timing routines and collect data yourself. And that's a perfectly sensible thing to do. But because what we're talking, what we are generally doing is looking at adding instrumentation into track the whole code and the time that's been spent all the way through your code actually it's something that we can do by the with the compiler when we're building our application because it's already going to go through and process your code and build your executable it can add in some extra code whilst it's building your application to track uh, performance data and to, and to track profiling information so what we generally do is use a compiler or some other tool to take your application and instrument it uh, to al allow you to collect performance data. And then you run your application, you collect the data and you analyze it. Now, of course, this means that profiling is, is impacting your code because you're adding extra code in just to track performance. It will impact the overall performance of your code. So when you do profiling, your code runs slower. And depending on the kind of profiling you do, can depend on how much impact you can have on it. So you can do some lightweight, pretty straightforward profiling where the performance overhead would only be something like five or 10%. So your code wouldn't go much slower. You can go full on sampling or, or so full on tracing sort of your application where you're looking at the performance of every single line of code um, or collecting very specific hardware counters uh, very often. And that can have significant impacts on the onto performance. So in general, we don't run applications with profiling turned on by default because it costs performance, but it's something we can add at compile time when we want to find out what's going on in our application. Standard profiling, really uh, sort of low overhead, lightweight profiling, it works at a function level, um, a function call level. where every time a function is called that that function call will be logged and the duration of that function call will be logged uh, and so then at the end of the application run you can get a um, data on how often each function is run and how long each function took up in the whole program so that's sort of the uh, simplest level of profiling that we can do automatically and then beyond that we can also instrument uh, in more detail to get things like hardware counters, uh, which will tell us things like cache misses, um, memory bandwidth usage, floating point usage, network operations, file system uh, reads and writes, those kind of things. And we can use that for more in-depth in depth looking at how well our application is exploiting the hardware features of a particular system we're, we're working on. <clears throat> 
There are generally two kinds of profiling we can do, sampling um, or tracing. So sampling is the uh, lower overhead one, but potentially slightly less accurate, depending on what, what your characteristics of your application are, particularly if you have uh, large numbers of small functions being called frequently, um, sampling may not necessarily be the, the most accurate way of tracking performance. And in this case, what we're, we're doing with sampling is we're not actually instrumenting each function call, but what we're just saying is we're interrupting the program at regular intervals and then saying what function is currently running uh, and then restarting the program. So it's it's uh, less of an overhead. Uh, but as I say, if you have small, large numbers of small function calls happening, you, you may not quite get the full application performance picture. Um, it's also um, useful to, uh, if you're doing sampling uh, profiling, then you really also need to be running for a reasonable amount of time. So tens of tens of seconds uh, to longer to get a good collection of performance data rather than running for very small uh, test cases. Now this, this is true of most profiling. Most profiling, you probably want to run for a reasonable amount of time to get a stable picture of your performance. You can also do um, profiling using a technique called tracing, which is the, the thing I described earlier, which is the more detailed way of, of collecting performance data uh, where, you, where you actually instrument each function call entrance and exit um, and uh, have a exact picture of how often each function was called and how long it ran for. Um, this is more intrusive, it, it has a higher performance penalty and can lead to very, very large uh, profiling data output um, if you're running for a, for a long time. But for most people, you know, the simple approach, the sampling approach, which most pro profilers do that by default, is sufficient to give you a, a, a good feeling for what your program is doing. If we were looking at standard serial programs on a on a normal uh, Linux Unix system, then there is a pretty um, common way of profiling across most pro most compilers. Because remember, it's the compiler that's doing this for us, uh, which is to use these flags minus p and minus pg, uh, and generally nowadays we use minus pg um, at compile time, um, and that generates uh, sampled uh, profiling data once you run your program. So you compile uh, um, like this with a, a minus PG flag everywhere you want to profile. And then you just you run your program as normal. And when it runs, uh, once it's finished, if you uh, compiled with minus PG, you get this file called gmon.out. Uh, if you compiled with minus P, you get this file called mon.out. And then you can view those files, view the data in them using this uh, program called gprof. Uh, and so you type gprof and the name of your program and it automatically goes and looks for this gmon file and loads it up and tells you the data. Um, and if you compiled with, a, with prof minus p, um, then uh, instead, instead of calling gprof, you call prof uh, and the name of the program. And so this will give you uh, useful information that looks something like this. So this is an example of the prof output for a simple program, which we've run for not very long here. So in fact, actually, you can see overall this ran for about two seconds, pretty short. As I said before, generally, you're looking to run for slightly longer than this for um, profiling. Um, but this is the kind of output you get from a simple uh, profiler. So here, prof is telling me that my program had a number of function calls, which are down the side here, relax, res ID, uh, read. Um, each of those functions were called a number of times. So relax and res ID were called 14 times each. Uh, and proportionally out of a program, relax took about 33% of a runtime. Res ID took about 28% uh, of runtime, and then some other things took more time. Okay, and so there's useful information here. Firstly, that actually, if I want to optimize this program, then these two functions are the ones to look at to start with, because if I can make those go faster, I can impact the performance of 60% of, of the 
overall uh, program runtime. Um, we can also see how often they're called. So what we can see here, actually, each was called 14 times. So that means that each routine is probably being called, is probably reasonably um, large in its run, and it's called infrequently. So I'm probably not going to have uh, massive overheads from a function call, uh, issues, those kind of things. Uh, but there's probably some work I can do inside these to optimize them. We can also see some other things going on here. So there's some functions that I haven't written myself. This double underscore F90 underscore close, the double underscore F90 SLR I4. Um, these are library functions that have been added in to do various bits and pieces. Um, and it's likely that these are associated with file IO. So I can see that about 10, 15% of my runtime, maybe 20% is actually taken up with uh, reading and writing or reading data uh, probably. Uh, so reading initial input data, um, and there may be something I can do there, or, or it could be that for this example, I, my my run was too short, and, and you know normally I would run it for ten thousand iterations, and this initial reading of the data at the beginning wouldn't be important. And then the other thing we can see here is that there's this routine here called m count, which has been uh, which is there and has been called a large number of times, and it takes about six percent of the overall runtime. And actually, what you see in here um, is an overhead of uh, the profiler itself. So this m count is not one of my functions; it's something that the compiler added in to do the profiling. Um, and you can see it's called a large number of times, uh, and it takes up. You know, it's showing me the overhead of, of profiling here is about 6%, maybe slightly higher because we have interruptions to deal with, but that's pretty much what's going on there. Gprof is, is similar, it gives you similar output, but it uh, produces you also a call tree sorted by inclusive time. So here, the output from prof is only telling me what functions were called how much time was spent in them. But we, we don't see any hierarchy, of course, here. We don't know, was one of these functions calling the other? Was res ID called from inside relax ID um, or not? Uh, and so there is some more inf interesting information we can get when we use gprof, which tells us the sort of hierarchy of function calls and uh, lets you look at the most expensive function calls, including their children, uh, so you can have an idea of where to, to focus your optimization effort. And that's what's useful. And then here, as I say, you know, the profile in itself has um, overheads associated with it. In this scenario, it was this M count routine, but it could be something called something else, M count, mon control, monitor. We've seen all these things come up. If it turns out in your profile, M count is, uh, is high, uh, so it's not 5 6%, but 20 30%. Um, then that's an indication actually that you've got some overheads from large numbers of small functions being called and and it may be that you need to refactor your code to to take out some of those uh, large uh, function a uh, large number of small function calls and maybe um, consolidate them into a small number of large functions and often we see this uh, certainly in the past it's, it's not so much a problem these days but certainly in the past we used to see it for sort of heavily object oriented codes where there's a lot of sort of get and set methods for data uh, for class uh, data and things like that uh, and if those things have been called very frequently then that can be an high overhead and there are ways you can get around that and, and optimize that performance issue away with things like inlining of code and and things like that. OK, so what we want to do with profiling is understand the performance of the code, because we may think we know where our time has been spent, but actually, in reality, that might be wrong. So profiling before you optimize is the thing to do. Profile on the, on the hardware you want to uh, optimize on. So don't profile on your laptop and then try and apply changes on something like Archer 2, because when you're on Archer 2, the performance may be different, may be variable. The bottlenecks may be in a different place. And try, if you can, to profile on, on the data sets that are important to you, so on a large problem or a full-size problem, because it could be that the bottlenecks that you're running into on a system that you need to optimize only appear when you 
go up to large scale. So only appear when you use um, large data, you know, large number of nodes, or the bottlenecks that you're uh, experiencing are only a, a, are a function of a specific way of using the code. So often we end up using codes which can do many different things. And my go-to example here is Castep, which is a materials uh, modeling code in the UK, but it can do all sorts of things from, from spectroscopy to molecular dynamics to uh, standard um, molecular simulations. And if you're running in different modes, then you are exercising different parts of a code and you may see different performance. So you really need to profile on the kind of input file that you want to use in production. And then finally, when we're optimizing codes, then it's not a single shot process. So we don't do this once and then forget about it. What you want to do is profile the code, do some optimization, and then reprofile it to see where you're at, because that profile will change over time as you're changing and improving your application. OK, so we're on, <laughs> on Archer 2. We have access to the Cray tools and the Cray tool the specific Cray um, profiler is called CrayPat. CrayPat can work in these two methods we've already talked about, sampling and tracing. Um, and, and there is a defined or recommended workflow for using CrayPat, uh, particularly uh, build an instrument that could sampling, run that code to get the profile, then you can rebuild your code to do tracing but only of the bits of a code which are expensive or important to you. And then you can run it again and get some more detailed information out of it. So CrayPat's quite nice in this sense that it has this sampling then tracing in an optimized way, a workflow built into it, which we can use. If you had been an Archer user, and we're now coming on to Archer 2, um, and I appreciate a lot of you are not Archer or Archer 2 users because you're our Trace attendees from elsewhere. Um, and I appreciate a lot of you who were Archer users will already be on the system and using it. But what we used to have to do on Archer was have we had to get the CrayPat tools, you had to do this thing called module load perf tool base and then module load perf tool light. Now, in theory, on Archer 2, this first step, module load perf tool space, is automatically done for when you done for you when you log on to the system. So you shouldn't have to do that. And when you want to profile, all you should do is have to do is do this module load perf tools light. That sets up the profiler for us and sets up the compilers to do profiling automatically. And then all you have to do is rebuild your application. So make clean, make, if you're using make, um, and, and that will build an application which is automatically instrumented for you. And then you can run that. And when you run it, you should get a file out with a funny name. So in fact, when you compile uh, with a perf tools light module loaded and you compile it, it should also tell you, oh, we're now building at the end when it links your application, it should say we're also uh, profiling here. Now, the annoying slight wrinkle here is there's a little bit of a bug on the system at the moment, which means that this perf tools um, base thing doesn't quite um, work properly at the moment as it should do. So what I, as Mark Bull uh, has already put in the chat, what you have to do actually now is when you want to do profiling, you have to first unfortunately do a module unload perf tools base, reload it, and then load um, perf tools, and then we should be fine. Now, this is in the chat, but I can put this up onto the slides for you as well, just so just so you know what you have to do. It's slightly uh, annoying. And in the long term, I'm hoping that, well, we're hoping this we won't always have to do this. Um, but uh, at the moment, this is what we have to do. So uh, let me just put it in here so it's clear. Bear with me a second. And I will now have lost my screen share, no doubt. So let me just share my screen again. Uh, I should have also said, if there's any questions as I'm going on, do please do um, please do just shout at me or put it in the chat because um, it's useful to 
to track these things as they're going along. And if there's anything that doesn't make uh, any sense, uh, please let me know as well if anything's not clear. So as you can see here, what we have to do is unload the perf tools base. Um, unload perf tools base, load perf tools base, load perf tools, and then load this perf tools light. Then we can just make our application and then it should just, everything should just work. When you run your application, uh, and you can see I've done this actually on the same code or a similar code that you use in the placement exercise, you run it and when it runs, it also should print out some stuff in your output file, in your output batch script. So here, what we can see is this application, uh, we've now got this kind of breakdown. So this is Craypat output, um, command line Craypat output. We've now got breakdown, which looks a bit more like the gprof output, which I haven't shown you yet, because it's it's grouping together things by different uh, types. But you can see here that uh, actually this, this uh, program didn't uh, take very long to run, uh, but we can see that 65% of it was was in what we call ETC. So this usually means system functions. 45% uh, of it was in MPI. And then about 7% was it in user code. Um, so this is my, my routines, my functions. Uh, and then there's some other stuff going on down here, uh, but we can probably ignore. Um, so the nice thing about Craypath, of course, is it, it, it's showing you some of the parallel stuff that Prof and Gprof won't really show you. Um, so it's it's telling you things about uh, MPI um, communications, and it will tell you things about OpenMP communications. And it knows you're doing parallel programs, so it can tell you stuff. So it, it hasn't come out very well on the slide here, but it can tell you stuff about imbalance between parallel um, uh, processes or threads. So which ones uh, are spending most time here, and which ones are spending least time here, and those kind of things. But other than that, it's pretty standard. Uh, profiling data. Uh, Craypat also saves you a bunch of data um, in a directory, as you can see down here. So it's application name and then a, and a set of numbers and letters at the end here. And we can, you see, Craypat is telling me I can do things with this. I can do a PAT report um, to get uh, identified calls of particular functions, to see the full call tree, to get um, a full report of expanded tables and notes. And I can also load it up in a, a graphical interface called Apprentice uh, 2 App 2. Um, once you've done that, you can also, uh, so this is doing automatic uh, sampling profiling. Once we've done that, we can also do tracing profiling or, or automatic profile analysis using CreatePath. So we build our application with the Perf Tools module loaded. Um, and then what we do is we use this program called Pat Build to take our executable uh, and rebuild it uh, in an instrumented form. Um, so I say Pat Build minus capital O APA name of my executable, and it will create a new executable with a name uh, plus Pat on the end, which I can then use to generate more um, extensive uh, and in-depth uh, information. And then that, when I run my application with that, produces a bunch of data, including um, a specific file, an APA file, which lets me instrument uh, the heavily used code in more depth. And then I can rebuild this again, pat build this again, um, using this APA file it produces, and then it will focus down right onto the routines that are heavily used and, and um, do more instrumented profiling there. Um, and then we can use the PAT report tools and the APP2 viewer to look at the data from those. So we can run this uh, perf tools in two different ways. One using the light, perf tools light approach, which is basic profiling uh, with simple data. Or we can use PAT build to instrument our applications and get more detailed data from our, uh, uh, from our profiling and then take it even further once we've done that and focus in on the specific uh, libraries or function calls or hardware counters we want to trace. Um, the nice thing about doing the more detailed profiling is it will start to give us things like hardware information. 
Um, so we can start to look at things like L1 and L2 cache metrics, uh, vector instruction um, uses, um, and ClearPath um, will also let you instrument different parts of the um, your application if you're only interested in those as well. Okay. Um, so the create pack will, will produce this information when you run your program. You can use that to do further profiling. You can actually also go in and, and add code in to say, just profile this function, just profile that function. It's also possible if you're able to use a create compiler to uh, enable more detailed loop statistics for, for loops inside your program using this flag minus H profile generate. Um, and then the career pat and the pat report will will generate you more detailed uh, information on specific loops inside your program that's only really works with a career compiler but this is the kind of thing you can get out of a detailed uh, career pat report so this is um some user code a function called remap and for in that you know 25 percent of a program time was spent in here it was called 460,000 times, so that's quite a lot. And then we can have a look at hardware counters, um, vectorization unit uh, counters here, uh, floating point operation, oh, well, uh, instructions, uh, L1 and L2 cache uh, misses, uh, TLB misses. And then it will also produce you some data down here on things like um, computed floating top point uh, time, uh, number of double precision floating point operations, uh, cache miss ratios, and, and these kind of things. And so this can also be useful to, to, to highlight to you which functions are using the hardware efficiently and, and which ones aren't. Uh, ClearPack can interface with these hardware counters, and that gives us extra understanding of how the hardware works. Uh, there aren't, um, loads of counters available on the AMD processors at the moment. So when you run your application, you can only instrument two counters at a time on Archer 2. If you want to get more of that, more than that, you, if you want to sample more hardware counters in more detail, you need to do multiple runs to collect that data. Um, we can tell ClearPath what hardware counters we want to select by using this environment variable, pat rt perf counter. Um, but, and the hardware counters are not generally collected by default, except if we're doing this advanced profiling, this APA, which if you remember before um, what we're doing, when we instrument it here, we put in this minus APA thing, uh, when we use pat build and that produces a new executable. When you do that, then ClearPat will start to automatically collect some hardware counters. Um, and then we can choose our specific ones if we're interested um, by uh, using this environment variable here. Um, so Barbara, that's a great question. What kind of rate is acceptable in practice for cache misses? So this is the interesting question, of course, is we can track hardware counters, but how do we know when what a good hardware counter is um, and what a bad hardware counter is? Uh, the answer is it depends on what you're looking at. If you're looking at level one to or level two cache or, or level three cache, uh, but in general, you want for good performance, um, you you look, sort of rules of thumb are looking to have L1 cache misses of of uh, or cache hits of 97% and above, L2 cache hits of somewhere between 90 and 95% and above. Um, L3 is a little bit more complicated, uh, but, but sort of those like kind of levels where you would see you're getting good performance, um, particularly at the L1 level, you want really quite high cache usage. Uh, and, and lower cache usage means that you're gonna be spending more time waiting for data coming in and going out. Um, yes, yeah, so there's detail on the system um, on what hardware counters are available. So there's three different ways. You can do man HWPC at the command line. You can do pat help, choose counters, choose roam and choose groups at the command line. Or you can just do more of this file here. Um, and actually this path might have changed. Let me 
I will check in a minute that path might not be um, 100% correct now, so I'll check that again. But those are the ways we can check what hardware accounts are available. Um, and in general, on the, on the Arch 2 system, we can look at a TLB, a branch, a memory bandwidth, um, memory bandwidth with stalls, uh, sorry, memory load bandwidth with stalls, memory load bandwidth with cycles, and stalls on the load store and floating point units. Those are the ones we can get. Uh, and this is an example of the sort of memory bandwidth data you can get out from, from Creapat, where we can see here that we've got um, some hardware that's running. So, so this routine called Sweepy that's running here, um, where the L3 cache bits ratio is 85%, uh, and the, L, the, the data to uh, cash ratio, cash ratio, hit, hit ratio is 86%. So we would suggest here that you're probably getting quite low um, cash hit um, rate on your L2 cache here, and probably needs um, some looking at data reuse there and, and uh, optimizing the data reuse. Yeah. Um, now, CreatePad is designed for parallel profiling, so you're going to be running across a bunch of threads or a bunch of processes. Um, performance numbers that it shows you in its in its summary output are averaged over all ranks. Um, but you may not want to do that because you may have a, a, a setup where you have a, um, a controller and a bunch of workers or um, multiple uh, programs, multiple data runs. And you may want to split it out so you don't um, you don't get all the processes data in there. So you can use PAT report and S filter um, and say, look, I only want all the processes with IDs of uh, less than 1,024, or I want all the even number processes, um, and it will give you that kind of data. Um, CreatePat will also give you uh, nice uh, finer grain detail on OpenMP um, applications. So it will uh, measure overheads of uh, looking at uh, parallel regions and uh, for, um, for or do loops. And you can see timing per thread rather than per process. Um, this is done by default for you with Cray compilers, but the AMD of the GNU compilers, which you can also use, we, what we would need to do is turn that on using the CreatePat uh, API. Uh, so CreatePat will let you have a look at uh, load and balance across your OpenMP and your MPI program, but also across hybrid programs. Uh, uh, so that, that kind of uh, imbalance can be useful. And it will also let you know how much memory is being used uh, across your uh, applications. Um, so all across your processes. So it will give you something like uh, what's the minimum number of, you know, so how much memory per rank has been used. And then you can use that to work out how much of the, uh, the nodes you may need. And you may be able to use fewer nodes uh, if you actually ended up using less memory than you thought you were. Um, it's also useful to understand sort of the, the balance of, in memory between one, your, your processor or your, or your, um, in your application. You know, are there some processes using much more memory than others, and, and is this going to be a limiting factor to your scaling? So, um, CreatePat will tell you things like uh, the amount of memory per process, um, and then you can work out from that the amount of memory per node that's been used, how many times you are free and, and uh, allocating memory, um, and also uh, potentially memory leaks. So if you've got many, any memory leaks, it will it will tell you something there. Now, tracking memory leaks in parallel in MPI programs is quite hard because a lot of uh, MPI um, RDMA work where you're talking to a network and to the switch and things can look like memory leaks to the program. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about the memory leaks um, unless it's looking like a it's a large value uh, over over time. Um, okay, so that was a quick tour through um, CreatePat.
um, and profiling and career paths. I mean, the things to take away from that, from my perspective, is that profile is important. We should always do some kind of profiling if we want to check our performance and optimize our code before we start. And there are some pretty simple tools we can use, but there are also some more involved and um, more detailed tools such as CareerPad, which let us play around with uh, things like hardware counters and get more detailed statistics on our application and on our parallel applications. There's lots of good documentation on CareerPad uh, on the Attitude website and, and on the HPE Career websites. Uh, but what we should do now is um, take our take a, a, a little bit of time to to look through the HPC, sorry, the the CareerPad um, exercise that we have, which is taking a, a simple code, parallel code, and then running it. Um, through CareerPad and seeing the kind of performance results we get out. Now, there's a different handout for this. Um, so there's a separate uh, exercise handout for this and uh, called uh, CareerPad Intro uh, off the website. So I'll show you that in a minute, but I see there's a couple of questions here. Uh, Mark, how well does it work on serial code before parallelization? It works uh, just as well. So anything you can do with the parallel stuff, you can do with the serial stuff in, in CareerPath. Obviously, it's not going to give you anything interesting about distribution across workers, but all the rest of the stuff works works perfectly um, well. So it's a it's a it's a sensible place to start with that. The only caveat I would say, of course, is optimizing a or collecting performance data on a serial application on a single on a node, a compute node, um, is slightly different than if you're running a parallel application there because of course what what you'll have is your serial program will run on one core by itself with nothing else on the node so potentially you'll end up getting better performance for that than if you parallelized it in uh, in a single process term because that single core has access to a bit more memory bandwidth than if there were other things running there competing for memory bandwidth so so you have to be slightly careful to to, to make sure you're yeah, uh, you make sure you don't um, over over expect to be able to do uh, better than you can with a parallel version because you're comparing to a single core uh, uncontended version. But apart from that, it should work fine. And, and yes, um, there's uh, OpenMP will will uh, work fine with with CrayPat. Um, and I think there is a uh, other things we can do with OpenMP as well. Um, so, so uh, Sashin, there's a question, can CreerPat identify shared or private variables uh, for an OpenMP do loop and give you those kind of hints? Uh, no, that's not what CreerPat does, but there is this um, other tool, uh, which we think, uh, yeah, was called Cray Reveal, um, and it's meant to uh, generate that kind of information. So it's meant to give you uh, uh, information on. Um, yeah, so, so Mark is saying he's, he's used that. So there's, a, there's, there's another tool called Career Reveal. I'll put it in the chat here, um, which can give you that information. Take your application, look at your loops, and, and look at either performance of your current op OpenMP one or um, um, help you optimize it from there. And it uses some of the same tools as, as CreerPat. So it, it's part of a CreerPat sort of suite. Um, and it uses the Apprentice, the APTP2 uh, uh, graphical interface and these kind of things as well. So if you want more information on that, I've not included it, but if you want more information on that, then I can, um, I can provide that uh, sort of offline. Any other questions? So what I will do is I'll show you the uh, show you the okay I can look that out for you uh, Sashin that's fine I'll show you the exercise we're going to do um, and then we can get on to do so here I'm on the GitHub uh, for this course at the moment I'm in the this sort of single node optimization course exercises lecture hopefully you can all see that. Um, and here we can see you've been working through the practical notes, but also this CreerPat intro here, which is a different PDF. So if you click on that, you'll see that there's a step-by-step -step guide to using 
um, create path and, and, and building this trace in here um, and, and lets you know how to run it and, and use it. So the next, you can keep doing the placement thing if you're not quite up to speed on that if you want, but uh, the next practical for you to do to try out would, would be this this Craypat one here and have a look at using Craypat on the code we have, which is the VH1 directory in the source code you already have access to. Hopefully this will all work. If you remember, we need to change this module load perf tools to module unload, um, module unload and then module reload as, as we have in the chat. If you have any problems with that, let me know. Uh, otherwise, uh, give it a go and see how you get on uh, and let us know if you have any issues. Uh, if we stick to timetable, uh, then we have a break um, in about 10, 15 minutes at one till two, and then come back after that for a lecture at two. Um, so I don't know if Mark wants to uh, just go straight into that lecture, and we can pick up the practical later and continue with it in the, in the next practical slot, which is probably sensible. Um, but Mark can let us know on that. Yes, no, I'll do that. Okay. Cool. So uh, if you get started with practical now, uh, break at one till two and then back for a lecture at two. Uh, if you have any questions, let us know. I'm quite happy to go through some stuff in more detail. Uh, Sashin, there's an interesting question. If the trace output is too large, can I download it on my local machine and visualize it with an appropriate visualizer? So you can. Um, uh, there are, I should have said, I mean, we, we're talking Cray here, so an Archer 2, so we're using Cray There are other profilers out there we can use as well. Uh, Vampire, Scalaska, these kind of things and uh, perfectly acceptable. Um, in fact, we have some some of those installed on the system as well. Um, for Craypat, I believe there is a uh, visualizer um, that you can download and install yourself. I'm not sure it runs in every system. So I wasn't, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. I, I need to check. Um, whether you can run it on a Mac um, easily. Uh, in fact, some of my colleagues here might be able to tell me better than that. But I seem to remember there was a standalone uh, visualizer we could do with that. Uh, but you can install locally. Uh, but let me check and get back to you. You can certainly get Craypat to produce all the text reports and download those. Um, OK, and another good question here from Mike. How different will the full system be? Um, so some software upgrades will happen. Uh, so some system software upgrades will happen. But from a user perspective, it shouldn't be any different really at all. Uh, it should be, it's going to be the same hardware. It should be the same uh, environment. It should be pretty much the same uh, configuration altogether. So they, they really should not be significant differences. If, if you optimize a code for the current Archer system, current Archer 2 uh, for cabinet system, then it, those optimizations would be uh, exactly what you need to do on the, on the full system once we get it up and, up and uh, installed and running. Um, because of the underlying uh, uh, processor hardware, network hardware is exactly the same. Um, so there'll be some slight changes to the software, but we shouldn't have significant performance impacts. Uh, if not, then uh, uh, do let us know if you have any problems or how you're getting on with the practical or, or if you have any successes. It's also good to know. Um, and uh, we will, as I we say, take a break one till two and, and see you back here at uh, two, but we'll, I'll be around uh, for now. Uh, so it's a, it's a good question. Uh, if we're not willing to optimize the actual code and just want to play around with compiler flags, would it still be worth profiling? Um, it's it's worth profiling. It's still worth basic profiling. Yes. Um, you're not going to be able to do as much with it uh, if you don't want to change the code. But there are still some things that you may get from it, like it may turn out that uh, what you need to do is restructure how you run on the compute nodes because your memory bandwidth limited. And actually, if you underpopulate uh, and use uh, less things on the nodes and you have cores and spread them out, then you can get better performance there. So you can get these kind of insights from that. Um, and it can also a little bit help guide what 
compiler optimization to do um, because if you can see that you know you're significantly limited by floating point performance and you may want to turn on some of the aggressive floating point optimizations the compiler can do or not otherwise so, so it still has some benefit it's not as it's not as crucial though i mean if you wanted to just play with compiler optimization and you just took your code and put it on and played with compiler optimization that would also be also be uh, perfectly acceptable um, of course you still need to do performance benchmarking so you need to run your code before you optimize the compiler and run it afterwards and compare the time difference and compare the results but but yeah um, it's it, it is generally focused on sort of actual application optimization um, is profiling yeah just to add to that i think it's it can if you're wanting to use very aggressive optimization flags it can be worth targeting those at particular routines because they can make other things go slower or break stuff. Yeah, it's a good point, Mark. I've seen some applications where actually you have to turn the optimization down for a particular file because it has routines in it which will break, but you can use other optimization flags, higher optimization flags in, in other files and sort of done it at that file level rather than the routine level. But yeah, definitely something that does happen in practice. 